it's pretty easy for us to be enticed with new. Like a new car. A new home. This is cute. A new job. <laughs> a new trend. A new look. A new you. Nope. And maybe that's not a bad thing. Because our creator seems to be all about new. Like a new promise. A new command. Hi. New life. Hi. New mercies. And even a new year. God not only loves new, but promises to make all things new. And we are invited into the sacred work. copy of God's Word, I want to encourage you to turn with me to Romans chapter 8 this morning as we wrap up our series, New Year, New You, on Romans 6, 7, and 8. This is our third series that we've been in in the book of Romans. Next week, we're going to begin our fourth series on Romans 9, 10, and 11. So let me encourage you to pick up some of these invite cards out in the foyer, take them with you, and invite your friends, your neighbors, your relatives, your co-workers, your enemies, invite everybody as we begin this series, Truths in Tension. And we're going to be looking at these, these truths that the Bible teaches that are always in tension. God's sovereignty, man's free will. People try to figure out this tension and the truth of the matter is there are some tensions that you're never going to be able to figure out. You just have to accept them is truth. And so we're going to be looking at Romans 9, 10, and 11. But today, we're wrapping up this series, New Year, New You. Romans 6 begins by telling us that we have died to an old way of life. We are dead in our sins, but Jesus makes us brand new. Aren't you thankful that when we come to faith in Jesus, Jesus doesn't hold on to our past, but he forgives our past, he puts our past behind us, and he makes us a brand new person. If you're a child of God, you are a new person in Christ. But you don't have to be a Christian for very long to realize that even though you are a new person, you still have some of the same old struggles. Some of the things that you struggled with before you gave your life to Christ, you still struggle with after you have given your life to Christ. You may feel different about the struggles. You may have a power to overcome those struggles, but you still have those struggles. Even the Apostle Paul talked about those struggles in Romans 7. He said, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. And then he asked this question, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? Well, praise God, there is deliverance, and that deliverance comes through Jesus Christ. In Romans 8, we began the chapter by discovering that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus has made us brand new. His Spirit comes to live in us, and His Spirit does what our flesh cannot do. There's no condemnation to you and I who belong to Christ. Last week, we discovered that even though there is no condemnation, there is suffering. You and I are going to face suffering as we go through this journey called life. Life is filled with suffering. But today, I want us to look at what I believe is one of the most encouraging, if not the most encouraging passage in the entire Word of God, Romans 8, 31 through 39. Now, as we begin, I want to tell you about an article that I read about six years ago. It was found in Forbes magazine, and the article was entitled, 35 Questions That Will Change Your Life. I encourage you to look up that article online, because the 35 questions really are good questions that you can put into practice in your life, regardless of what you do. Some of the questions that this author asked were these. The first one, 
Why don't you do the things you know you should be doing? Think about it. Why don't you do the things you know you should be doing? And then he said this, life isn't about figuring out what to do. The real challenge is simply doing the things we know we should be doing. There are some things that we know we should do, but we don't do. And if we will just figure out what those things are we know we should do and we start doing them, it will change our life. Another question, what are your values and are you being true to them? What are your values? Everybody has values and are you living according to those values? He goes on to say, when we don't act congruently with what we value, symptoms of discomfort arise. In other words, when I value something but I am living another way in my life, it always produces tension in my life. Another question, in what ways are you being perceived that you're not aware of? That deals with our self-awareness. Perception is reality. The way people perceive you is the way that, that they see you. So you need to make sure for better or worse that you know what people really think about you. And then he said this, if you weren't scared, what would you do? I mean, if there was no fears in your life holding you back, what would you do? And then he said this, he said, use the rocking chair test. What would your 90-year-old self, looking back on your life, advise you to do in the moment? And so if your 90-year-old self was looking back at this moment, what would your 90-year-old self tell you to do? What risk would they tell you to take? Another question, what's your why? And then he went on to say this, if you have a big enough why, you will always figure out the what and the how. If you don't have a big why, you'll always use the what and the how as an excuse for not doing that thing you said you were going to do. If you've got a big enough why, it's going to always answer the questions of what and how. One other question, he said if you were dying, would you worry about this? You know, we all have things we worry about. But if you were dying, would you worry about this? And then he said, we so easily lose perspective on what takes up our energy and our focus. We're all dying. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves of this to enjoy living. Now, those questions are good questions. But today, I want us to focus on some questions that I believe can change your life, not only here on this earth, but for all eternity. I am convinced that if we know how to properly answer these questions, these questions can put to death fear in our life. And if there's one thing I know that each and every one of us struggle with to some degree or another, is fear. We all have fears, don't we? Now, we have different fears. We're afraid of different things. And some of the things that I am afraid of, you would think are silly. And some of the things that you're afraid of, I would think are silly. But I want you to know that if we can answer these questions correctly, it will put to death fear in your life. And that's something that God tells us to do over and over in his word. Over and over again, we're told, fear not. Fear not, fear not. The Bible says that God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. Fear doesn't come from God. So how can we live our life in a way that we are going to live the best life we possibly can without fear? Well, the answer is found in verses 31 through 39. So if your Bible is open, let's read it together. You can look on the screen. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us when God has chosen us for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. 
Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean that that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are all killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, there are multiple questions that are asked and answered in these few short verses. But I want to break them down into four basic questions. Here's question number one. If God is for us, who can stand against us? If God is for us, who can stand against us? Now, Paul is not saying here that that no one or no thing will ever oppose us. He's not saying that we will never face opposition. Paul himself faced incredible opposition. He faced opposition from the the Jewish religious leaders. He faced opposition from from pagans who worshipped false gods. He faced opposition from the Roman Empire. Paul wrote about his opposition. He said that he faced beatings, he faced whippings, he was in jail and in prison, he was shipwrecked, he went without. Paul knew what it was to face opposition. The truth of the matter is, listen, follower of Jesus, the truth of the matter is, life is filled with opposition if you love Jesus. I know there are some of you here today who have a bad boss that is making life difficult for you. There are some of you here today who have a spouse that is antagonistic, that that seems to be standing against you. Some of you have a, a chronic health problem. Some of you have difficult kids. Some of you are facing a host of other things in your life. But I want you to know today that life is filled with opposition. Paul is not saying you're not going to have opposition. What Paul is saying is that regardless of what we face, regardless of who we face, no one, no thing will ever be able to thwart God's purpose for your life. No matter what you're facing in life, nothing, no thing will ever be able to thwart God's purpose for your life. A better translation of verse 31, rather than if God be for us, is since God is for us. Or because God is for us. You see, Paul isn't asking a question, is God for us? The answer to that is without a shadow of a doubt, yes, God is for us. He is for us. Let me tell you, child of God, if there's one thing you need to hear today, it is this. Write it down. On your note sheet, put it in the margin of your Bible. God is for you. God is not against you. God is not neutral when it comes to you. God is for you. The creator God, the God who made the heavens and the earth, the God who is the all-powerful God, the all-knowing God is for you. And because he is for you, It doesn't matter who stands against you, amen? That's what this is saying. It's not saying that you won't face opposition. You will. But it doesn't matter. If God is for us, and he is, who cares who stands against us? If God is for us, and he is, who cares what things stand against us? You see, because God is for us, we can face any enemy and come out on top. Because the opposition we face may seem big, but oh, dear friend, our God is bigger than any opposition we face. Growing up, I felt like my dad could do anything. And because of that, I felt safe around my dad. 
My dad was a man's man. He was a Marine. He could build anything. He could conquer anything. He could do anything. To me, he was the strongest, the smartest man alive. It didn't matter what he faced. I knew that my dad would come out on top. He never faced an enemy that he caved to. He never faced a threat in which he backed down. I can remember when I was a young teenager, there was someone who was trying to put a liquor store next to the church that my dad pastored, and he stood against that. And he kept that liquor store from being opened next to the church. But one night, we were at church on a Sunday night. We came home. We got in the house, and we could tell something was different. And what was different is someone had filled our house with buckshot. Someone had shot into our house. We never found out who did it, and praise God, nobody was home. But did that cause my dad to back down? Did that cause my dad to cower? Absolutely not. And because of that, because I saw my dad face opposition, I knew that when I was with my dad, I was okay. And understand, when we are with our Heavenly Father, we are okay. It doesn't matter what we face. Write this down. God plus one always equals a majority. God plus one is a majority. Noah discovered that, didn't he? It was Noah, one man against a pagan world that was living in rebellion and wickedness. He was a one-man righteous show, and yet he was the one who came out on top. Or what about Moses? Moses stood against Pharaoh and all of the armies of Egypt, and he came out on top. Why? Because God was with him. Or what about Elijah? When he was facing down the prophets of Baal and Asherah and that wicked queen Jezebel, who came out on top? He came out on top. Why? Because God was with him. Here's what you need to learn. If God is for us, it doesn't matter who is against us so what is it what is it that God is calling you to do what mountain is it that God wants you to climb what enemy territory is it that that God wants you to conquer that you think it's impossible you think it can't be done oh dear friend greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world if God is for us then who cares who stands against us? If you can learn that truth, it'll change your life. Second question Paul asked was this. If God didn't even spare his son, won't he give us everything else we need in life? If God didn't spare his son, then won't he give us everything we need in life? We just closed on my mom and dad's house this past Friday and I am so thankful for that it was a long process we were cleaning out 80 plus years of stuff 60 plus years of marital stuff and I mean made lots of trips to the dump we took other stuff to to storage we rented a storage unit a 10 by 25 storage unit got tons of stuff in my garage And then we had an estate sale. And my wife went there on a Friday and we worked our fannies off. Setting up everything else that we weren't putting in storage, that we weren't putting at my house to keep, that we didn't take to the dump. Everything else, we were setting it up for this estate sale so that we could make some money for my mom and dad's account. And as we were putting out all this stuff on Friday, my mom wasn't there. My mom came in on Saturday and My mom would look at something and she said, now how much are you going to ask for this? How much are you going to ask for this? And I said, mom, not what you think. (laughs) Because I said, here's what you need to understand, mom. Something is worth what someone is willing to pay for it. It's not worth what you paid for it. It's not worth what you think it's worth. It's worth what someone is willing to pay you for. I I discovered this. My wife and I discovered this over 13 years ago. When we moved here, 
to Lexington from Orlando. We had bought a house, and, and the, the housing market in Orlando just, it went crazy. I mean, crazy good. I mean, housing values were going up like crazy, and people were having bidding wars. They were having duels out in front of people's houses to see who would be able to get the house. And so when we knew we were moving to Lexington, we put our house up for sale. And someone came literally within two days and offered us $15,000 less than we had asked for our house. And we said, no, no, we can get asking price. We sold our house two years later for $150,000 less than they offered us. You see, we got caught up in that housing debacle. Values were going down, and we couldn't keep up with it. And we kept on saying, our house is worth more than that. Well, it wasn't. People wouldn't give it to us. We ended up having to take what we could get. When we were cleaning out my mom and dad's house, one of the things that were in there was a treadmill. I mean, it was brand new. I mean, I, I don't know if my mom ever used that treadmill. But I, I knew I couldn't sell it for what it cost new. I looked online to see what it cost new, and I said, well, I'll ask a fifth of what it cost new. Well, I ended up selling it for half of that, $50. You see, something is worth what someone is willing to pay for it. Now, what does that have to do with us? What are you worth? Here's what God said about you. God did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for you. That's your value to God. God gave his son for you so that you could be a part of his family. Now, I got to tell you, I love you guys. I really do. I feel so blessed to be your pastor. But I ain't giving you my kids. I ain't giving you my grandkids. You can come to me today and say, Rocky, if you give me your kid's life, it will save my life. I'll say, I'll see you in heaven. You ain't having my kids. You ain't having my grandkids. I love you. I'll see you in heaven. God didn't spare his son, but gave him up for us. He didn't do that while we were loving him. He didn't do that while we were serving him or following him. The Bible says that he did that while we were enemies of God. God didn't even spare his own son, but gave him up. And then Paul says this, so why wouldn't he give us everything else? Duh. I mean, if God has given us his most prized possession, do you really think he's going to hold anything back from us? And, and yet we, we live that way. We, we have this idea that, that, yeah, God gave his son for us, but, man, we have to suffer through this life and struggle through this life, and God's not going to meet our needs. But God said, I will supply all of your needs according to my glorious riches, which are found in Christ Jesus my Lord. I understand God's promise to you and God's promise to me is if he did not spare his own son, then he will give us everything else that we need in life. Understand, God didn't save you and then leave you on your own to struggle with your marriage. He will help you. God didn't save you to leave you on your own trying to discover his plan and his purpose and his will for your life. He will help you. If God didn't spare his very best, do you think he's going to hold anything else back from you? He's going to give you everything you need in life, and he has unlimited resources. God didn't spare his son. Won't he give us everything else we need in life? The answer is without a shadow of a doubt. Here's the third question. If God accepts me, 
Who dares accuse me? I want to read these verses to you again, beginning in verse 33 and verse 34. Who dares accuse us when God has chosen us for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. Now there are really two questions here that Paul asks and answers. Who dares accuse us? And then he asks the question, who dares condemn us? And the answer to both of those questions is no one. The answer to the first question is no one because God has already pardoned us. He's already justified us. He's already declared us not guilty. Past tense. It's already been done. And then to the question, who dares condemn us? The answer is no one because Jesus took our condemnation upon himself. Jesus has already paid the punishment for our sin. Now here's what I know. When you and I as followers of Jesus walk through life, we mess up. We blow it. We stumble. And and I don't think I'm alone when I say that when we mess up, we blow it, and we stumble, we feel guilty. We feel ashamed. We have regret. We have remorse. But what happens is our enemy, our adversary, Satan, in Romans or Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, he's called the accuser of the brothers and the sisters. What happens is when we mess up, when we blow it, Satan comes in and he takes advantage of that. And he begins to whisper things in our ear like, (laughs) see, you're worthless. You don't love God. God, you don't love Jesus. My word, if you love Jesus, you wouldn't be doing the things you just did. You wouldn't be saying the things you just said. You wouldn't be acting like that. If you love Jesus, you're not saved. You've not been changed. You're worthless. Why don't you just give up? That's what the accuser tells us. How many of you have ever experienced the cues or whispering in your ear or something like that? I know I have. I have. But here's the good news. When the accuser comes and whispers those things in our ear, the Holy Spirit, we're told in Romans 8, and the Son are both pleading on our behalf for us. You see, they are reminding us that our sins have been forgiven. We've been pardoned. Our condemnation has been taken by Jesus. And because Jesus has already paid the price, who's going to accuse us? Who's going to condemn us? The answer is no one. Oh, dear brothers and sisters, listen. In this world, you will have struggles. And there are going to be times when you fall on your face spiritually. There are going to be times when you flat out blow it. And your blowing it may look different than your neighbor's blowing it. But there are going to be times that you blow it. But praise God. Praise God when we blow it. Our Father isn't there yelling at us for messing up. Our Father is there picking us up. Saying there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The accuser can throw all of these veiled accusations at you, but you've already been justified. Don't listen to his lies because that's what it is. Final question. If we are God's children, can anything separate us from his love? And the answer is no. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, Neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the power of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. John Stott was an Anglican priest in the last century. And in his commentary on this verse, he wrote this, Our confidence is not in our love for him, God, which is frail, fickle, and faltering. Now let's stop there for just a minute. Our confidence isn't in our love for God. 
at our very best, our love for God is frail, it's fickle, it falters. I mean, i got to be honest, there are times that, man, I, I don't feel like I love God the way that I need to love God. And, and it's not that I'm out doing some heinous thing, it's just that my affections aren't directed toward God. They're directed toward other things. You remember what Jesus said? Jesus said that if our love for the Father doesn't cause our love for everyone else to look like hate even, we don't even love the Father. And, and there are so many times in my life that, that I, get, I get caught up in the things of this world and I love the things of this world. Are there any things in this world that you love? Or are there some people in this world that you love? And there are for me. But oftentimes my love for the Father is not what it should be. But you see, our relationship with God isn't dependent upon our love for Him. Let me go on and read that quote again and read the rest of it. Stott says, our confidence is not in our love for Him, which is frail, fickle, and faltering, but in his love for us, which is steadfast, faithful, and persevering. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Nothing. Can your sins separate you from the love of God? Nothing. Can your failures separate you from the love of God? Nothing. Can the demons of hell separate you from the love of God? Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's why we as Baptists hold on to this, this belief called eternal security. We believe that the Bible teaches that once we're saved, we are saved. You know why? Because our security is not based upon our love for God. Our security is based upon His love for us. Our security isn't based upon our ability to hold on to God. Our security is based upon his ability to hold on to us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Here's the problem. You and I don't see this acted out day by day. I mean, we go to a wedding and we hear this couple Say to one another, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. And we think, this is great. This is a love story made in heaven. And it lasts for maybe a few years, maybe several years, maybe 20 years, maybe 40 years. But, but we've all seen these people who have stood before a pastor and They've made these vows that we're going to love each other till the day we die. And something happens. And that love that they proclaim to one another, they no longer have for one another. And we think the way that we humans express love is perhaps the way that God expresses love. If we let God down, if we fail God, if we mess up or blow it, God's going to go and he's going to find somebody else to love. But nothing will separate us from the love of God, which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Some people call this, this doctrine on, of eternal security the perseverance of the saints. But, but Stott said, in light of this passage, it should be called the perseverance of God with the saints. And that's a better definition. It's not about you and I being able to persevere. It's about God persevering with us. And so what's the bottom line in this passage? Well, here's what I believe it is. We don't need to live in fear. We don't need to fear opposition in difficult times because God is for us. And if God is for us, then who cares who stands against us? We can conquer any enemy. We can face any opposition because God is for us. We don't need to fear our, whether our needs are going to be met or not because if God didn't even spare his own son but gave him freely, then do we really believe that he's going to hold back secondary things from us? No. 
He will give us everything that we need in life. We don't need to fear being accused by Satan or condemned on judgment day. Why? Because we've been justified already. And Jesus has took our condemnation upon himself. And we don't need to fear God turning his back on us, rejecting us, or abandoning us. Because nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what's keeping you from walking in victory today, child of God? You see, these promises are for the child of God. If I've been saved through Jesus Christ, if I've been born again, if his spirit lives in me, then because God is for me, nothing can stand against me. Because I am a blood-bought child of God, and God did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us, then he is going to meet my every need in this life. Because I have been saved and redeemed and born again, I don't need to fear when the enemy accuses me and mocks me and tells me I'm unworthy because I've already been justified and my sins have been paid for through Jesus. And I never, ever need to worry about God not loving me anymore because nothing, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Now listen, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, you've not been born again. You've not turned from sin and trusted Jesus to save you. This passage doesn't apply to you. These promises are for the children of God. But why would anyone in this room leave here today? without saying, I want those promises. Here's the thing, you can have them. And so if you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to encourage you this morning to humble yourself, to turn from sin, and trust Jesus alone to save you, and discover the life that he created you to live in the first place. I want you to bow your head with me. Close your eyes. With your head bowed and with your eyes closed. If you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, and today you're willing to humble yourself and turn from sin and trust him to save you, then I want to invite you to pray this prayer right now. Dear Jesus, I humbly come to you this morning asking you to forgive all my sins. I am so sorry that I've lived in rebellion. I don't want to live that way anymore. Jesus, I believe you came to this earth. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave so that I could be forgiven. I'm trusting you to save me. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Make me brand new. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer. Thank you for saving me. Amen.